Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Today, you're tuned into the portrait series, part four, the final part of this series. Today, we're talking about post production and image delivery. Of course, a warm welcome to Mr. Tony Gale, Sony Artisan of Imagery, and to our host for today's event and this entire series, Sony. A huge thank you to all of our viewers. You know the deal by now, but if not, then I'm going to tell you, get those questions in. Tony's going to take it from here. He does a wonderful job of just surmising everything of what we have going on, what we've done in the past. We're going to drop some links for those of you who have not seen parts one through three. But Tony, welcome. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Always great to have you on. I will uh, step aside here virtually and I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A. Sounds good. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Derek mentioned, I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony artist of imagery. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen me before, but in case you haven't, now you know. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in and they'll get fed to me and uh, hopefully I'll have an answer. So today we're doing part four of the portrait series, post-production and image delivery. Um, with all of these things, and especially with produ post-production processing and image delivery, there are as many ways to do any of this as there are photographers. So there are going to be people who do things in a completely different way. And if that works, fantastic. And if it doesn't, maybe this is helpful. Everything any of us do could get better, um, but it's all subjective. If what's working for you works for you, take the parts that don't, make those better. It's, we're all different. So in addition to being a Sony artisan of imagery, I'm also a BenQ ambassador, a man photo ambassador in X-Rite Colorado. And I am a commercial photographer based here in New York City, mostly photographing people in portraits. Coming up uh, with me, if you can't get enough of me, um, or you know or you know what you want to avoid, either way, uh, we have splashes and pours with Sony Speedlights next Monday. We have... Uh, a lesson and critique series on June 20, starting on June 26th, uh, which is speed lots and location. And then on July 3rd, we're going to do a critique of speed lights on location that people like yourself submit. Uh, July 10th, the second part of the lesson and critique series, we're going to do experimenting with photography. Uh, then, oh, that date's not right. It's not July 3rd. It's I believe the week after, uh, we're going to be doing a critique of images that you as well have submitted experimenting with photography. And then June 20th, uh, we're going to be doing a lower Central Park portrait photo walk. Uh, most, if not all of this, should be up on the B&H event space website so you can learn more and uh, be reminded. Um, additionally, aside from the things I'm doing, there are a lot of Sony sponsored talks with the VH virtual event space. Monica Sigman, um, Scott Robert Lim, Thibault Roland, a bunch of cool people, all of that stuff, it's free. I recommend that you at least take a look and see if any of it makes sense to you. They're all great people. I, I've known them all a long time. They're all worth learning from. Also, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sony has the Sony Alpha Female Facebook group. They do a micro grant every week based around a specific theme that you would photograph. You do not have to identify as female to be part of the group or to submit for the micro grant, um, but it's a very inclusive community. Uh, everybody's very nice. When people ask questions that in another Facebook group, other people tell them to read the manual or try Google. People actually answer the question instead, like civilized human beings. Uh, it's a good group. Uh, also, if you want to know more things about Sony, alphauniverse.com, great resource for both Sony and photography in general. Obviously, Sony runs it, so it's, it's Sony-centric, but things like this one, Four Tips to Elevate Your Landscape Photos This Summer by Autumn Schrock, that applies even if you don't photograph with a Sony. If you photograph with your phone or with another brand, there's tips and things you can learn no matter what. Also on Alpha Universe, they have a creator profile. It's free. You can put up a gallery. You can explore what other people are doing. You can have a place where you can send people to see your work. You can search by specific topics, portraits, for example. Here's my profile. 
And there is the Sony Alpha Universe forums. It just went up last fall, late summer, fall, where similar to the Alpha Female Facebook group, you can ask questions, you can post pictures and get feedback. You can just muse about photography and people are kind and decent and it's a pleasant place to be. Um, for those of you who don't know, Sony introduced a couple of weeks ago the ZV-1 Mark II vlogging camera. It looks very cool. It's very similar to the RX100 series, which is one of my favorite little cameras. Um, because it's for vlogging, one of the big changes is it has an 18 to 50 millimeter equivalent lens. So if you're holding it like this and vlogging, it's a good focal length. Uh, Alpha Universe also has, whenever there's specials on Sony lenses and cameras, obviously you can go to B&H2. And you can you could go to Alpha Universe, see what the specials are, and then go to B&H to buy them. The advantage here is that you can see what all of them are in one place. Bunch of lenses, bunch of cameras on sale. You can see the same deals on the B&H website here. Um, and just to get a sense, because people sometimes are curious what I'm using, the Alpha 7 R5. Oh, you can see I purchased this product on October 28th, 2022. Uh, is the camera I'm using the most, I also use the Alpha One, which I purchased on February 15th, 2021. Um, both great cameras. Um, you know, I've had people say in the past that I poo-poo APS-C. They're also great. Just because these two cameras are great doesn't mean that something like the Alpha 6400 or 6600 or 6100 isn't also a great camera. There's a lot of great cameras out there, and the right camera for you depends on who you are and how you shoot. Um, Lots of amazing lenses, which leads into, we are an exciting time to be photographers. Uh, AI is a strange and remarkable new thing, um, but photography is still amazing. And with the tools that are available to us, like the cameras and lenses I just talked about, for example, we are able to do things with photography that were not possible uh, in the past. 20 years ago, the fastest that you could shoot a, a, a film was 3200 ISO. Maybe you could push it to 6400. Now something like the Alpha 7 S3 will go to 400,000 ISO. Yes, it's grainy at 400,000 ISO. There's a lot of noise, but you can still capture a picture which you could never do in the past. The autofocus is incredible. The drive speed's incredible. The technology is absolutely amazing. We are in a, a golden era for that. All right, so post-production and image delivery. In broad strokes, we're going to talk about getting your pictures onto a computer, uh, importing images into a photo application, organizing and sorting, post-processing and processing, exporting, backing up, which is very, 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 very important, uh, and distributing the images. How do you get them out there? Um, some of this is going to jump around a little, and it's going to be tailored towards how I do things. This isn't necessarily a comprehensive, this is every way to do all of these things because that would take a month. Um, this is how I do things. There are a few things I'm going to show you more than one way, um, but there are other ways as well. Uh, so see what works. So to begin with, transferring to a computer. I, 99.5% of the time, use a card reader. I use a card reader so that I don't have to plug my camera in or have my camera on. And because I frequently will shoot enough images that I'm using more than one card. So if I were to use my camera and plug it into the computer or try and do FTP, um, it would take a long time and the camera's occupied and on during that time. I have to make sure the battery's charged, all that stuff. Or you can just get a card reader, plug it, plug the card in, plug it into your computer. It's faster, it's easy, it's stable. You can go take more pictures with your camera while you're doing it. Uh, it's I much prefer that method. So you've got things like this, the UHS-2 SD memory card reader, 27 bucks. As of today, all, every, all these screenshots with prices are as of today, uh, June 5th, 2023. So tomorrow, who knows? Um, the card reader I'm using the most now, though, is this. It's the CF Express Type A slash SD card reader. Because the newer Sony cameras take CF Express Type A cards and SD cards, so I have some of both. The SD card reader only won't do CF Express Type A. This is also uses the USB 3.1 Gen 2 interface instead of Gen 1, so it's faster. 
Uh, it's very robust. I like it a lot. So starting out, you took some pictures. Well done. Now we need to get them onto the computer before we can do anything else. So I plug my card into the card reader, plug the card reader into the computer. One of the first things I do and offloading cards, there's very much a lot of different ways that people choose to do this. Um, I'm going to explain how I do it and why I do it that way. Uh, but, you know, see what works. So the DCIM folder, which is a subfolder within the card's file structure, you click on that. That's where the photos are. And then there's another car, uh, folder. Usually starts with a 100. Sometimes it's 101 if you roll over the card, read the number. I rename that to the date. So in this instance, it was a couple of years ago. 2021, 07, 06. So I rename it to the date, both because I have all of my folders with images named in this way. So if I took pictures today, it would be 23 underscore 0605. Tomorrow would be 23 underscore 0606. And that way there's never duplication and everything's always in order. Um, the reason I rename it is both so that it has that name to begin with and when I put this card back into my computer, I'm sorry, back into my camera, if I hit play to check it, I won't see anything because I've changed the file structure and I'll know that I downloaded the card. Um, I have had plenty of times where I put a card into the, uh, into the camera, hit play. I'm like, I think I downloaded this card, but I'm not sure. And then I'm afraid to use it. And then maybe I don't have enough cards. Uh, so this way I know that I've used it. And I have once, only once, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, photographed on a card that I reformatted and used again that I had not downloaded, but I thought I had. And that is really a bummer. Do, you really, really, really want to make sure that you don't overwrite a card that you haven't actually downloaded. So I changed the name, and then I just drag and drop. There are all sorts of software that will automatically import and do all sorts of stuff. Uh, I do this because I like to know that I saw it happen. Um, and I can also then click on the card, see how much, how many files there are, how much space it takes up. Click on the folder on the computer, see how much space it takes up and how many files there are and make sure everything transferred properly. So that's what I do first. Download the card. If it's multiple cards, um, I'll rename the folder, the DCIM subfolder there, the 100, whatever it is. I'll rename that, but instead of just dragging that whole folder over, I'll drag the contents into the folder I made before so that everything's in one folder for the date. And then you want to import and rename. So the first thing I do after I've downloaded the card is open it up and either sort by subject. So let's say I'm photographing I spent all day and I photographed six people for a magazine. So I photographed Bob, Jane, Sarah, Fred, Frank, and Brunhilde. I don't know if that's six names. Um, what I'll do is make a subfolder that's A, B, C, D, E, F. One for each person. I'll put all of Bob into Bob. I'll put all of Sarah into B. I'll put all of Jane into C, et cetera. I'll separate those so it's easier when editing to look at people individually as a group. Because if I'm photographing multiple people like that, it's usually photograph person A for a while, then B, then C, then back to A, then D, then back to B, and it jumps around so it's not sequential. So then use something like Bridge, move all of those uh, images of a specific person into a specific folder, A, B, C, D, E, whatever, drag them in, and then Open the folder, select everything, uh, go up and go to batch rename. So batch rename, you can also control shift R if you're on a PC. I'm on a PC because I built my own. Um, batch renaming is your friend. I use text, which is the date, same as the folder structure. So in this case, 2301 underscore 0120 underscore. If I have A, B, C, D, E, whatever subfolders, then it would be A underscore. And then either a three or four digit sequence number. I use three digits unless I shot more than a thousand frames of somebody or something, and then I'll use four. And you just hit rename. Boom. 
It's like magic. One of the main reasons to rename is every 10,000 frames, your camera goes back to one. Right, you get to 9999, the next frame is one. So if you don't rename over time, you're gonna have multiple images with the same name, which can cause issues where maybe you accidentally overwrite something or you can't find something. You wanna avoid that. Whereas here, by renaming, I know by using the date, the year and then the month and then the day, that date never happens again. <clears throat> you know, today, 23 underscore 0605, after midnight, that day is over. It never happens again. So anything I photographed today that I named that, there will never be a conflict with those names. And that's the case forever. So that's why I use that structure. Again, different people have different methodologies. Some people put the name of the subject in there, all sorts of stuff. I do that with metadata. Uh, so you do all that, batch rename, piece of cake. That's in bridge. Now, maybe you don't want to use bridge. Maybe you're going to want to use something like capture one. So capture one, similar thing, select everything. You right click, batch rename. Capture one is a, has a lot of options. So does bridge for that matter with renaming. So I use job name, three digit counter or four digit counter, same thing, but you can drag all sorts of things up there and it will automatically populate those if you want. Camera serial numbers, copyright notice, all that stuff. I don't usually do that, I just put it in. Same thing, date, number, it's easy. Lightroom, you can also rename. I do use Lightroom, I use Capture One, I use both of them. I almost never rename with Lightroom only because if there is a way to not get it to use a dash before the number, to use an underscore, I haven't found an easy way to do that. And I've I've looked a lot and I've seen other people talk about it. I'm not saying it can't be done because it's amazing the number of things that you think can't be done that can. Uh, but I don't like the way that it renames. I just don't like the dash before the number instead of an underscore, so I don't use it. Um, but in Lightroom, <clears throat> as opposed to Bridge or Capture One, which you can just steer to a folder, tell it to open a folder and it just populates, you have to import. So. You're in your library module, you go to import. If I'm doing Lightroom, I typically do it per project. I don't have a Lightroom catalog that's everything I've ever photographed because uh, it would be enormous. Um, so for each project, if I'm using Lightroom, I create a new Lightroom catalog. So create a catalog, hit import. It's always gonna prompt you to do that at the beginning. Drag the folder in. Um, if you have done something like A, B, C, D, E subfolders and you don't click the box in the upper left that says include subfolders, then you're just going to see nothing. It's going to say there are no images. So if things aren't looking right, just click that box and see what happens. Click the import. It takes some time. Uh, if you've shot thousands and thousands of pictures, it can take a long time. You let that go. Then you go up to uh, rename photos in library. You see it there on the upper left. Shortcut is F2. Decide what you want it to be. I do custom name plus sequence. Same thing. Um, but as you can see, oh no, you can't. Uh, you can see with the little example there at the bottom, there's 23 underscore 0120 dash one. I just don't like the dash. All right, so you've downloaded your card, you've renamed everything so that tomorrow when you take more pictures, they don't have the same name and everything's clear and you it's organized by date. The next most important thing is to back up. Before I do anything else, I back up the files. So when I download things to the computer, I have a working drive. I have an 18 terabyte working drive that I call working. Um, when I buy drives, I try and get enterprise level drives, which are designed to be used more. Um, everything's on there. Then I drag and copy that folder to two external hard drives. I have little uh, portable bus power drives, and I have the bigger drives that you plug into the wall. I have one of each. I keep a set at home, and I keep a set at my office in the city so that they're separated. 
So once everything's backed up, it's in three places while I'm working on it. The working drive, the backup at home, the backup in the office. The number of times I've seen people on Facebook or even friends ask what to do because a hard drive failed or sometimes people have a hard drive stolen, you know, it's in your bag and you're walking around or you leave it somewhere. If you haven't backed it up, you're in a lot of trouble. Sometimes if a hard drive fails, you can recover it. And sometimes you can't. Depends on what went wrong and how damaged it is. If it's stolen, you're never going to get it back. Back up everything. First thing after it's renamed, I back up everything. I wait until it's renamed because I want the names to be the same throughout. Obviously, if I backed up and then renamed, then it's not necessarily, I renamed in one drive, but not the others. So back up and then rename. But I'm also obviously doing this right away. So if there's an issue at any point in this process, I still have the cards. I'm not reusing those cards until I've done all these steps. So back up, always back up. I said at the beginning, there's a lot of different ways to do things and reasonable minds can disagree. Backing up is not something that I think reasonable minds can disagree on unless you don't care about your pictures. If, you don't, if you're like, yeah, if it gets lost, who cares? Well, then that's up to you. Um, but you know, you'll hear about somebody who did a wedding, their first wedding or something, took a bunch of pictures, half of them are missing because a hard drive failed. You do not want that, always back up. Here's some of my drives, the little ones and the big ones. All right. So we've done all that. We've renamed. Um, to a certain extent, we've organized and sorted by shot and subject. The next thing I do is I go through and I rate images. Depending on what's involved and how important it is, this step could take different forms. If it's just a shoot for myself, um, what I'll do is just make an either Lightroom or Capture One. I'll make the thumbnails as big as possible. And I'll quickly go through and just click on everything that I think is a possibility, which could be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Just go through, click, 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 you know, control click so that it stays clicked. Um, one advantage Capture One has over Lightroom in this case is if you accidentally click in the wrong spot, so it deselects everything. In Capture One, you can control Z to have it reselect it. You can undo. Lightroom doesn't seem to do that unless it's changed recently. Uh, so that's one way I might do this. Sometimes I will just make quick JPEGs of everything to send to someone to select, uh, but usually I'll remove the bad ones. Just going through, select, 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 select. Uh, then what I'll typically do, these are rated five stars, is everything I've selected, I will rate one star. Um, I will also periodically, so this folder has a ton of frames. It looks like, uh, well, I don't see a lot. I will periodically hit the one star and tag everything as I'm going through, just in case I do something crazy and I don't have to start over at the beginning. So everything that's a maybe, that's one star. And then I'll start narrowing it down from there. One thing that Lightroom does better than Capture One is the way in which it allows me to narrow it down. So then if you go to survey view in Lightroom, you can select in this case, eight images that all look similar. And I can start just, you can, I don't, you can't really see it, but if you hover over it on the lower right, there'll be an X. If you hit that X, it removes it from the survey view. So you can narrow it down, narrow it down till you have the two or three that you like instead of the eight or the one. Make that one two stars, three stars, and just keep going, keep going. I start with one stars. The things I still like go to two, then to three. Final selects are five, even if I don't necessarily do three, four, and five all the way, depending on how much I narrow it down. But just keep narrowing it down. Um, another thing that Lightroom does really well is if you want to go through everything individually, which I do as well sometimes, if you hit caps lock and you're in library view with single view. If you rate an image, anything it auto advances to the next image. So I will have a finger on zero and a finger on one, one on the number pad on the right of the keyboard, one on the, so zero there, one on the upper left. And I'll just give everything a one or zero and it will just keep auto advancing if cap, caps lock is on all the way through. So you can see every individual image big and rate it something. 
and then just narrow down from there. All right. So downloaded, renamed, backed up. We've made our initial selects. Um, I know as is often the case, I'm going quickly because I always put too much stuff in here and there's way too many slides. So I'm trying to cover a lot. If I go too fast, you can always watch it again. If there are bits that you think, ah, this part I know too well, uh, if you're watching the recording later, just fast forward. So there's a lot of software out there that you can use with your images. Um, I'm always shooting in RAW, so bear that in mind. Some of what I'm talking about is more specific to RAW than JPEGs, but most of what we're doing should work either way. I'm going to briefly go over Sony Imaging Edge, which is free software you can download to use with Sony cameras. Capture One Pro, which is not free, and Lightroom, which is not free. There are also a lot of other uh, image processing softwares, Luminar, Affinity Photo, DxO, On One. Um, I've never used, well, that's not, I think I've tried a couple of them, but I don't remember which ones, and I don't remember uh, what, I, I obviously didn't like it that much because I didn't still use it. Um, so I use Capture One, Lightroom, and Imaging Edge, Capture One and Lightroom more than Imaging Edge, but Imaging Edge has the advantage of being free. And it has the advantage of if you are someone who finds that when you're shooting RAW plus JPEG, you really like how the JPEGs look, but not the RAW files, Imaging Edge is going to do the best job at making a RAW file look like the JPEG that you liked. And then you can adjust it from there because it's all Sony and they're using the same thought process. So Imaging Edge, you can download it. It comes essentially as three different things, remote, which is for tethering, a viewer, which is a browser and lets you make batch edits, and then edit, which lets you do uh, adjust everything individually. So here we are in viewer. Uh, you can sort and filter one stars, two stars, two stars or more by camera model, by lens model, all sorts of stuff. You can tell it to sort that you only want to see JPEGs or RAWs or TIFFs or whatever. Um, but we're going to talk about how to get some good color and start there. So you find your gray card. We're going to go over if you didn't shoot a gray card, but everyone should always shoot a gray card. I don't always do it, but almost always when I don't, I wish I had. Uh, so if you double click in Imaging Edge, it will open up and edit. If you look over there on the right, you can see that there is uh, something called specify gray point. You select that, click the eyedropper, and just put the eyedropper on one of the gray ones on the upper, on the top. The two in the middle are the best ones. Um, I think most people go for the slightly darker one. If you select that, what that does is it tells the software, I know that this is neutral gray. If you're using a true gray card that's spectrally neutral, that will make all of your color as accurate as possible with one click. Um, if you photographed, say, in the woods where everything just feels a little green and it's hard to get the balance or any number of places, this is a quick way to get neutral color. Now, neutral color doesn't mean it's the color you want. Um, but it is neutral and it's a good place to start. And then if you want it warmer or cooler or whatever, you can do that. So you just click on that. Now, an important thing in Imaging Edge is if you want to apply this to other things, you have to save that setting. So you go up, save image processing settings. It saves it as an XML file. I tend to put that XML file in the same folder that the images I'm processing are because I'm unlikely to need this particular file again, except with these images. All right, so I've saved that. Now I'm gonna select these images. Go over here. I wanna batch process, I wanna process them out. So I go to output. Uh, you can see there's a button, apply each raw file its own setting or specific settings. So you say uh, that you want selected ones. I am in TIFF, I'm in 16-bit, I told it where the outfit output is, and I just select that uh, XML file that we put in the same folder so it's easy to find. We select it, you can ask it to tell you what it's doing. So 
it says all I've done is specify gray point. I want it to be a TIFF. I want it to be 16 bit. I want it to be Adobe RGB. I want it to save in my output folder on my drive D, my D drive. I just hit save and it saves. So if you want a batch process in Imaging Edge, that's what you do. You can either just tell everything to process as normal, or if you've made any adjustments, you just have to save those adjustments as that sidecar file. Uh, if you want to get more into the nitty gritty, maybe you didn't shoot gray card. Here we, we are back in edit. So white balance over there on the upper right, you can see there's camera setting, there's preset. Preset are essentially duplicating if you had set any of these settings in camera, especially because you're using the Sony software. Capture One and Lightroom have similar settings. They're all going to have flash and daylight and cloudy, for example. They're not all going to look the same because they process things differently and just their interpretations of things are different. That's good in that you can figure out what works best with your workflow and what your vision is. Um, it's not good in if you're trying to match two things, although it can be done, it's just more work. But so here we are on auto, cloudy. You can try a bunch of different ones. Um, and then you try it, you find your white balance. You can also duplicate the creative looks that Sony cameras have. So there's a creative look thing, uh, drop down. And you can try the different creative looks. If you're someone who uses creative looks, you didn't do it in camera, you can do it here. Uh, you can adjust, you can turn on and off the dynamic range optimizer. You can adjust sharpness, clarity, noise reduction. Uh, you can turn lens correction on and off. Uh, I always turn lens correction on in any software I'm using uh, just because uh, it's easier than trying to decide if I need it on my own. And a lot of the newer lenses from every manufacturer are designed with that in mind. Uh, you can also go in and adjust a tone curve. So now I've made it very, 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 very contrasty. Uh, you can tell it to show you if you've got clipped shadows. So all those yellow are places where it, it's so dark that I've lost highlight detail or shadow detail, especially because I've done a pretty dramatic curve. It'll show me clipped highlights. There's no clipped highlights. It'll show me out of gamut colors. So whatever color space you're in, there might be colors that can't be well represented in that color space. Um, we're not really talking about getting into the nitty gritty of that. Like always calibrate your monitor, get a good monitor. Um, that's all important. So display out of gamut colors, you can do that. You can adjust uh, the exposure, the color temperature, everything. So I'm just going to skip ahead. And then you want to output. You just go up to output, same settings as before. There you go. Uh, you can crop. I'm just going to skip ahead because I feel like I'm going to run out of time. All right. So then capture one. I use capture one more. Uh, it's a very full featured, like Lightroom. Capture One and Lightroom are both very, very full featured. Capture One will tether natively with Sony cameras. Lightroom, you need a plugin. Um, tether Tools makes a plugin you can buy. It works very well for Lightroom. So here we are in Capture One. Uh, we're going to white balance. So we've got our, our uh, gray card. Um, we're going to start with that. We've selected the five stars just because I did that to make it easy. It's the exact same thing. You select the eyedropper, you put it on. Um, it neutralizes the color. Then in the upper right, you have an up and a down arrow. You hit up to copy. Then you select everything you want it to apply to. You hit down to paste. And it applies that to everything. So that's not just with the gray card. It's any settings that you change, uh, exposure, contrast, saturation, highlights, shadows. You create a curve, you create a crop, all of that stuff. That's how you apply it to everything is with that up and down arrow. So here we are. Maybe we didn't want to do a gray card. We try some different things. So this is a shot. So the auto white balance of camera. This is daylight. 
So you can see strobe and daylight, this was a strobe, are supposed to be the same color, but they're not necessarily. And this is dramatically different. So daylight, much too blue. Cloudy looks pretty good. Tungsten, terrible. Shade, way too warm. Cool white fluorescent, not good. So back to cloudy. So if we didn't have the gray card, I would start with cloudy. And then I'm just adjusting with the slider, the Kelvin slider to warm it up a little bit. Lowering the highlights a little to decrease the contrast. I think the highlight side's a little too bright. Just adjusting things a little bit. Uh, playing around with exposure. Maybe that's too bright. Maybe that's a little bit better. And then we're going to export and send it on its way. So the export settings are upper left. The Capture One export settings are more complicated than all the others. So you select what kind of file you want to save. It comes with recipes that you can change. So you select on one, then you see if that recipe is what you want. You can also create new recipes with that plus arrow. I just always change the recipe to do whatever I want. Um, putting it in the working folder, subfolder. It will put it in subfolder if you tell it to. Make sure it's TIFF, uncompressed, 16-bit. I always process as 16-bit TIFFs. I mostly process as Adobe RGB 98, even though Profoto uh, RGB is a bigger gamut. Just checking the folder, doing everything. Um, you can select any of a number of ICC profiles if you would like. Again, I just use RGB 98, but you can do anything you want. You want a CMYK folder, you want an RGB, it's all there. All right. Uh, so we do all that. Then a couple of things we skip, just so you know that they're there. Uh, there are some creative styles. You can change uh, the ICC profile be a little bit more. So it's specific to Sony cameras when you use this. Um, most of the raw processors now know what camera you're using and have a specific profile built for that camera and sometimes a curve built for that camera. So no raw processor, unless you turn all the curves off, defaults to nothing done. It feels like nothing was done, but they all default to some recipe automatically applied. So in here, you can see there's a curve. It's on auto. You can try film extra shadow, film standard, linear response. You can try different things. Most of the time, I just leave it on what it is because I'm going to adjust it more uh, once I get into Photoshop. And I'd rather have a more flat file to bring into Photoshop than a more contrasting one. Uh, you can go in and adjust the profile for the lens. So you can see under shape and then down lens profile, it knew I was using the 100 STFGM. So it ap applied a profile to that. It will generally do it automatically. You can also, if you want to, use a different lens profile. The only reason to do that really is either the it doesn't know what lens you used for some reason, or you want to just do something and see what happens. Um, it's never going to be, I shouldn't say never, it shouldn't ever be more accurate using the wrong lens profile, but you can try it just to see. There's a ton of them. All right, so that's Capture One. Now Lightroom. Start with Lightroom. Um, one thing in both Capture One and Lightroom is every once in a while, you're like, why are these files not in the order I think they should be? Uh, it could be that the default sort order was something different. So they both like to default, default to capture time. I always want them to default to image name. So you can go and just click on that to change it. All right, we've selected some images. Gray card, same thing. Just open up the gray card, pick target neutral. Then we select the ones that we want to apply that to. Um, and then you just hit sync and it will sync, uh, it will sync those images and apply those settings. Um, one thing with Lightroom, especially if you hit sync and you've applied a crop, there's a uh, little pop-up that you have to select crop. Um, hold on, I see I have a couple of questions. I don't want to lose them. Uh, Yitzi in Berlin says, I generally shoot family events. Typically I distribute 60 to 100 images. They start at 30 megapixels. 
The question I have, is there a more effective size resolution to distribute than what they do? Um, that's a very subjective thing, uh, Yitzi. Uh, I typically give people a medium res, maybe 3000 pixels on the long side. And then if I know that they need a higher or lower resolution than that, I will do that. But if it's someone where it's just a regular person, 3000 pixels on the long side is generally pretty big. That'll get you, you know, that's 10 inches at 300 PPI. Um, so I'll start there. I don't worry about if it's, you know, 240 PPI or 300 PPI or 72 PPI, because that the pixel count matters. The PPI only matters for certain software. It doesn't actually change the size of the image. Um, so I can't really answer your question because it's subjective. I tend to do 3000 pixels on the long side for people. Uh, they're just regular people and they don't believe need a larger one. And then James on Vimeo, when you have no choice but to shoot under fluorescent lights, can you bring back clients' natural skin tones in post, or is that impossible? It is not generally impossible. It is possible that if you have really, really, really terrible fluorescence, you might not be able to. Um, but if you have a good gray card, something that's spectrally neutral, and spectrally neutral means that gray is gray even if it's under different colored lights, some gray cards if they're not spectrally neutral under certain lights, the color might not be the same. Um, shoot with a gray card, click on that. You should be really, really close, uh, even under bad fluorescence, unless they're really, really, really bad fluorescence. All right, um, where were we? So we're in Lightroom. Um, we're trying some different white balances here. So this is as shot, cloudy, tungsten, custom messing with it a little bit, uh, adjusting the highlights like we did in Capture One, bringing them down a little. <clears throat> and then in Lightroom as well, if you go over to the develop module, a little bit like those different profiles in Capture One, you have different uh, profiles in Lightroom. So Adobe Color is the default, uh, but Adobe Landscape, Adobe Monochrome, there's a bunch of different ones. You can try different ones and find that for your style, maybe one of them specifically works better. Um, also, sometimes if you're like, why is everything all weird? It might be that you have the ICC profile wrong in Capture One or the profile wrong in Lightroom. So always check that. Lightroom also, similar to Sony's Imaging Edge, has their version of the built-in Sony uh, looks that you can do in camera. So those options do exist uh, to a point. I don't think they have sepia um, in Lightroom as well. So you can play with those over there under, under favorites and then camera matching. All right, so then uh, you also in Lightroom want to enable profile corrections. You can see it there in the develop module on the lower right. It also should default to the correct lens. If it doesn't, or if you just wanna see what happens when you do weird things, you can see there's a lot of options. Um, you could, I'm shooting with the 100 STF here with the Alpha 7 R5. Maybe you wanna see what happens if you do the 100 to 400 with the 2X teleconverter. Who knows? I did not try it. Uh, and then uh, if let's say you wanna export, you've done all this work, you're ready to go to the next step. So we export either because you just want to give the client or the subject low res to pick from, or for some other reason, like I said earlier, I typically will send low res for either my subject or the client to pick their selects from, and then I will do all the hard work on the ones they select. Uh, so upper left, export, same thing as before. You can select TIFF, JPEG, your color space. One thing important on Lightroom is I always tell it to include all metadata. Uh, you can tell Lightroom not to. And if you do that, sometimes you're like, what lens was that? And it's been stripped from the metadata. So I always tell it all, all of it. All right, so you process things now. Here's the question with more post processing. Do you do the rest of it yourself? or do you use outside retouchers? I do both. Whenever I can, I send it to outside retouchers. Um, if I have 
if it's a big enough job and I have a budget, I will use a local retoucher because in general, I find that someone that you can speak with and meet with is going to do a better job. Sometimes I don't have that budget and I'll use uh, retouchers from overseas. Um, with retouchers from overseas in particular, um, there's a step I think I have in here I'll show you, but if I don't, I'll explain it. Um, if I'm doing it myself, first thing, you know, you've got your white balance, you've gotten your exposure, uh, you've gotten your all of that. You want that done in the raw processing before you process it out because that's all stuff that is really difficult to correct in Photoshop with the same effectiveness as in the raw processor just because the information's not there in the process file. Uh, the first thing I always do, healing brush, just look for uh, little imperfections. You know, maybe somebody has a zit or something in their skin. Maybe there's a little bit of dust. Just use healing brush, usually spot healing brush, to clean all that up. That's my first step. If I've sent it out to retouchers, uh, what I do, especially for the overseas retouchers, because sometimes they go too far, is here's the retouched image. Copy it. Now I have, I didn't screenshot this, but you can see on the lower right, there's two layers. There's the background and layer one. Layer one is the retouch version. Uh, the background layer, when I have it on, is the unretouched version. You can see the difference. Uh, and I will do that so I can see what's changed. And if I feel like they've gone too far, I can erase down uh, and remove some of what they've done. Uh, some of the other things I frequently do, this background, it's white-ish, but it doesn't look that good. Photoshop, some of the tools they have have gotten crazy good. Selecting a subject to make a background a different color or to remove it used to be really, really difficult. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. It was something I frequently had retouchers do. Now Photoshop has select subject or remove background, just click, background's gone, just like that. Then what I typically do, add a layer, fill it with white, and then copy the base layer, move it over the white layer, I'm big on lots of layers and making sure that anything is undoable later. There have been times when I have put a lot of time and effort into a photo, felt like it was good, looked at it the next day, and it was terrible. Um, if you're doing things in layers and you've got all these things that you can undo, maybe half of the work was good and half of it wasn't. If everything is flattened and together and you're not using layers, once it's done, it's done. You have to start over. All right, so maybe you want to add some curves, new adjustment layer curves. Again, maybe you want to make things look really weird by really messing with the curves or just a little bit of contrast. Save it. I also have um, actions for the things I do all the time. So everything is always saved as a high res layered TIFF. And then I have an action that saves everything as a JPEG, a high-res JPEG in sRGB, because that's typically what I deliver. Um, back to the question the person had before. In my experience, if people don't always know what to do with TIFFs and people don't always know what to do with Adobe RGB, maybe whatever they're looking at can't handle it and it looks weird. So I almost always convert to sRGB and to JPEGs. And like I said previously, if it's, a situation where I'm delivering to just a regular person, often I will size it down to 3,000 pixels because I've had situations where people call me in a panic because they can't open the file or it's too big and they don't know what to do. All right. So you're exporting. We're going to revisit that a little bit. We talked about sizing. You also want to know how the client's going to use it. Like I said, I typically deliver an sRGB, but Sometimes they want CMYK. If they want CMYK, you have to ask exactly what CMYK profile they want. Usually it's SWAT too, but if it's not, you need to know because it can make a big difference. Or is the output just delivery of files? Is it a print through a fulfillment service? Are you printing on your printer at home? All of those have to come into play. And like I said, we could spend a month on this. So just think about what it is to decide. And then distributing images. So you can email them, obviously, if they're small enough. I typically send images through PhotoShelter or WeTransfer. Uh, I like PhotoShelter because I can add a I can add permissions. 
I can either let specific people who have to create a free account access, I can give them a password. I can give one person a password that lets them see the pictures, but not download. Someone else, a different password can download, but only low res. And the third person has a third password that will let them download high res. I can do a lot with that to really control it. We transfer all use sometimes because people get confused or sometimes it's just one picture. Um, but even with WeTransfer, you can go in and you can tell it, at least with WeTransfer Pro, you can create a password. You can tell it when you want it to expire. You've got lots of details that you can get in there. You can tell it not to expire. Um, so we've done all that. We've backed up everything. We've processed files. We've sent the high res to wherever they need to go or the low res or whatever they are. Once I've done all that, I also upload all of my final high res layered TIFFs to Photo Shelter. Uh, I have an account, There's, they have an unlimited account. Um, so everything gets up there. So if I need to access it from anywhere in the world, I can get to it. And then I have a local RAID 5, uh, RAID array that has all of my process files since 2002. So this is my capture one, this is my RAID 5. You can see 2002, 2003, 2004, et cetera. And then each year has one, two, three, four for months, January, February, March, et cetera. Uploaded and backed up on a RAID 5 and backed up because the RAID 5, if you lose any one drive, you still have redundancy. All right. I went through a lot really fast. Um, if you have questions, you're welcome to reach out if you, or if you can uh, let us know here. If you uh, want to learn more about me or Alpha Universe, here's where to go. I was doing a podcast. There's one more episode that's coming up, but it's on a hiatus now. We'll see if I get back to it or not. But I spoke to over 200 photographers who use Sony cameras from all over the world. New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, France, UK, everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, Dubai, I think, Egypt, Colombia. Lots of places, um, but you're welcome to listen to that too. All right, let's see if there are any questions or any remaining questions. Yes, we, we will open it up for questions. You're always so thorough, Tony. I feel like if there's no questions, it's because you went over everything or anything else. People just don't know what to ask. Or they're in a daze. They're like, they're dizzy from <laughs> too much. Information overload. No, you're, you're super it's, thorough with it. It's tough. There's so many things to know and there's only so much time well yeah i mean it's it's a super especially when we get to this part we want to talk about all the, the fun stuff right taking the photos and this i think this is the part that stresses a lot of people out and this is the part that you you kind of it's easy to get off in the weeds you get into ppi and dpi and where's it going and it like you said earlier with with the question a lot of it's situational yeah it's what you're doing it's hard to give one size fits all answers for stuff that's well if you're posting it here if you're sending it here it all depends what's it going to be i think i i run into that all the time i i kind of laughed to myself when you were reading the question from yitzi because it's like man i i think i have this question every single time i send someone images and it's different every time yeah that's, it's hard it's hard you know the one the one time that you think that someone's gonna you know you, you send somebody a folder of proofs and you tell them, hey, if you need anything edited, let me know. And of course they don't. They post the proofs. Yeah. And I've, had, you... I've had that happen way too. I'm like, you know, I can see dust in the background. I can see <laughs> there's a and scuff that, mark on the floor. And that's Just... always, that's the one person that wants to make sure that the photographer gets credit. And it's the one time that the photographer is like, no, you don't need to tag me. Just, just no, we, yeah. I didn't take those. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tony, it's always great having you on. You, we have everything right up here, everybody. And look, I would, I personally would love to see the Alpha Photographers podcast come back. That, that sounds super interesting. And I know we get a lot of you guys on here, but it's always different when you're among, I mean, it's a different peer level when you have two people that are kind of on the same plane talking shop. So it sounds super interesting. I'm going to have to check it out. Well, there, there's over 200 episodes. I got some catching up to do. Let me add it to my Netflix and uh, HBO Max list. They're, they're all pretty much between 10 and 20 minutes. So I, I kept them bite-sized. 
I like that. I like yeah. that. Bite-sized podcast. Perfect. Yeah. That's, a, that's a concept I think a lot of podcasts could take uh, some notes on. But uh, Tony, always good to have you on. I know uh, we do have a ton of events with you coming up, both in person. We got some in person left. Uh, we have the virtual as you had gone over. So you guys, if you haven't checked out the website, check out the website. I know there's, there's definitely some more that we still have to get up on the website. So keep an eye out for Tony's events and all of our other events, but that's it for this afternoon. Tony, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks everybody. Tony and, uh, all of our viewers out there, but, uh, that's all we got for you guys for now. We'll, uh, we'll check back with you this week with some more great information for free. <laughs>